Changing to help you move through the challenges of life? Then join Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church of Gastonia for an inspirational message prepared just for you. Go over to 1 Timothy. We started the last week here. God's been dealing with us about speaking, decreeing. We want to live lives of success. I reminded you last week, for those who may not have been here, that back in December we talked about something good is coming out of this. Talked about transition and triumph how what you do in transition is going to determine the level of your triumph. You may be going through a difficult transition, moving from one thing to another, going through some hurdle over a hurdle, dealing with something. We've been jumping this morning. And how you, how you handle your transition right now is going to determine the level of your triumph. Because it is God who has caused us to triumph in Christ Jesus. You can't allow the things you encounter to become the ball of confusion that will break you. You got to be proactive. We talked about uh, how it's not a time to be distracted. This is not the time to go off course, as the songwriter says. How much distraction have you encountered already this year? We talked about how you got to be strategic and not just emotional. Because we can be so emotional about what we want and we're excited about it, but, but we don't put a strategy, a plan in place to make it happen. And so we got to use all of our talents, all of our gifts, and put them into action. And we talked about in the first week of the year, how you got to speak life to it. They just finished ministering us about speaking, 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 decreeing, saying. And so we've talked about the bones, the first of January. It was a word that dealt with restoration. It was a word that dealt with hope and productivity and strategy, fresh start, recovery, another chance renewal progress we looked at how Ezekiel spoke to what was a dead dry situation and the words that he began to speak were not his words but they were words that God was speaking through him and he caused life to come into those dead bones. You've got some situations that you need to speak to. You've been walking around with your mouth closed and not saying anything, and, and it's just happening all around you when God said, I've called you to speak. And you know, when we speak, the Bible says over in one of the Psalms that, that when we speak, because we speak God's word because the angels are standing at their positions waiting to move on what God says that at his beckoning they will move to his command and when we then speak what God says angels begin to move on our behalf do I have anybody see I'm not just talking about babbling and saying something just to be saying I'm talking about being proactive and being in agreement with what God says. And when you agree with what God says, then the angels follow what God says. And in fact, then God says, I'm lending them to you to cause those things that be not 
to become. There's a key to excess, success. We, we talked about overcoming bitterness as a key to success. And last week, uh, we looked at another key to success, which is self-discipline. This is Paul talking to one of his sons in the ministry. And we're so happy to have one of our sons in the ministry. Amen. Elder Apostle and, and Lady Curry, thank you all for coming over. They had their service a little earlier and, and came in. Thank you so much for being here today. God bless you. Verse number six of First Timothy chapter number four. I usually read from the New King James, but I, I wanted to read this from the Amplified, beginning with verse six. If you point out these instructions to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished through study on the words of the faith and of the good Christian doctrine which you have closely followed, but have nothing to do with irreverent folklore and silly myths. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, keeping yourself spiritually fit. For physical training is of some value, but godliness, spiritual training, is of value in everything and in every way since it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. This is a faithful and trustworthy saying worthy of full acceptance and approval. Is that the essence of what your Bible says? Then we're together. This is again, I want to talk about a key to success. Let's do it this way. Self-discipline is a key to success. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor. Oh, good neighbor. Let's help Bishop talk about self-discipline, a key to success. And this is part two. Turn on the other side or behind you. Get somebody else. Look them in the face and say, neighbor. Oh, good neighbor. If I hadn't said it, good morning. Say, neighbor, I don't know about you. I'm going to help the bishop talk about self-discipline, a key to success, part two. Drop those hands and give God praise as you take your seat. I, I talked about how we, you know, we make all of these New Year commitments and all these uh, plans and things that we're going to do and, and how they are based a lot of times on emotion and not strategy. And, and a strategy is, is nothing big. It's a plan or a method to reach a goal. I want to do something, and so I am going to develop a method, a way to make it happen. And so we talked about last week just for refreshing um, uh, that when it comes now to developing a more disciplined life, uh, discipline is necessary uh, since some believe things are going to happen any kind of way. They don't see that it's necessary to have discipline and self-discipline. And, and we talked about last week how wherever we are right now, it is as a result of our self-discipline. All right, wherever we are, whatever we have achieved, whatever we have not achieved, we suggested that it is a result of our current self-discipline. You may have had a rough past. You may have made some mistakes. Someone may have done you wrongly, but wherever you are now, uh, you are at a place because of your own level of self-discipline. And so it suggests to us then that, and that if we want to go higher, if we want to experience more, uh, then we've got to make sure that, uh, that we've got to know the road to get there and we've got to plan to become more self-disciplined. Somebody say self-discipline. Just talking about it 
uh, this year is my year and I'm, I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to stop my habits. I'm going to save money. I'm going to start paying tithe. I'm going to finish my degree. I'm going to serve God more. I'm going to grow more in the word. Uh, none of those things are going to happen beyond where they are right now if you don't change and elevate your current level of self-discipline. Do I have anybody? And uh, so we're going to look at today. I want to go a little further. Um, and I told you last week, write this down if you didn't have it. These are important things. That, that um, we have three things that I believe that God has placed us here in the earth to do. You remember one? To live, to live again with God eternally. I believe that's our first responsibility. That we got to live to live again. How do you do that? You become born again, knowing Jesus Christ and beginning to live out your life now. When you get saved, when you accept Christ as Lord and Savior, your eternal life with God begins right then. We don't wait until we die to get ready to go to the by and by. Our eternal life with God begins at that moment. And so we have been placed here in this earth to first of all, live to live again. And then the second thing that we are placed here for is to help teach somebody else to live to live again. My responsibility then is to do as Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. Uh, uh, whenever you are filled with the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth, we're supposed to be helping somebody else be saved. If, if we just needed to be saved ourselves and God didn't want to use us to help save somebody else, we could have gone on to heaven at the point that we got saved, right? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're still here. And so that means that you ought to be witnessing to somebody. You ought to be trying to help somebody to get on the right track. You ought to be trying to help somebody else to turn it around. Come on, don't just get it turned around yourself and then look back over your nose at the people you used to do the same thing that they're doing with. Uh, yeah, don't now snare up your nose at folk that you used to hang out with. Yeah, am I talking about it? Yeah, we get saved and then we get new and then we act like that uh, we don't know anything about any and all of that. No, what we're supposed to do is we get saved, God brought us out, and so he could take us back in there and begin to witness and begin to share with them and they can see the difference in your life. Huh? But oh, some Christians get big, you know. They start talking about folk, you know, that's doing this and that. Uh, they, 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 they have spiritual amnesia. Uh, yeah, yeah, they forgot. Come on, it, it hadn't been so long ago. And, and you better watch it. It, it. You mess around. Given an opportunity. Come on, somebody. You run right back in that rabbit hole. Huh? Yeah. And then, the, and then the third thing I believe that we are placed here for is to live and succeed in walking out our God-given purpose spiritually, in the marketplace, in the community, and in the family by what we learn through the church. And so when we look at those things, when we look at those things, uh, it involves every aspect of our being. And so today I want to talk a little further. When we talk about success, success is only real when one is doing to the glory of God what he or she is led to do. That's when you call it success. It doesn't mean that one is successful just because he has a lot of money, just because he's accumulated a lot of stuff. Come on, some just because uh, that name might be uh, in the marquees of life. It doesn't mean that uh, it's success. It is only success when we are doing unto the glory of God what God placed us in the earth to do. And if I'm not sure about what God placed me in the earth to do, I need to pray, God, show me my purpose. Give me my direction and help me to understand why I'm here. You got to understand that a pastor is no more of a success 
no matter what size this church is, than one who is working a job and doing it to the glory of God. If that's what you're doing and you're working and you're working hard and honorably and doing it to the glory of God, then you are a success just like uh, somebody who might be in a spiritual vocation because we understand um, that the writer in Colossians said that, that whatever you do, he said, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men because it is from the Lord that you receive your inheritance. Come on, somebody. So it doesn't matter now. I might not be in a full-time five-fold ministry. I might be working on a nine-to-five or, or, or 12 to seven at night. I, I might be working in a department, but when I go in there, when I show up because I'm a part of the kingdom, then the kingdom of God shows up. And when I begin to work my work in ministry and people will see that I'm not just working a job, I'm doing ministry and that means I'm doing it with excellence and with integrity. Come on somebody, I'm doing it honorably so that God can get the glory and somebody will say there's something different about that uh, particular person. There's something different about that truck driver. Something uh, different about uh, that doc worker. There's something different about that nurse and, and about that teacher. Uh, it's all because you recognize that God has me on assignment wherever I go if I'm sweeping the streets then I'm going to sweep to the glory of God because I'm functioning uh, even as a pastor or an evangelist or anybody in the fivefold ministry full time because we are all here with different assignments and different callings and responsibilities we want to have success without toil we want to have success without any pain. Isn't that right? We've been sold the idea uh, more and more in this day that, that uh, the, the, the shortcuts that we can see and, and we can enjoy success without experiencing any kind of great challenge. Man, marketing companies are good. They are, aren't they? I think they're geniuses. I think marketers are geniuses. Those people who, who uh, create commercials and, and uh, advertise products, they can create something that, uh, that whets your appetite in 15 or 25 seconds. They have you salivating. You, you, I can do it. I, I, boy, I want that. I can do that. I, if I just, they said I could. And they created that thing. They put the right music to it. And they put the right shots across there. And before you know it, they'll have you saying, you can do this and you can have it. In, and, and it can be done in, in 10 days. They got me one time, Deacon Wingo. They advertised this thing. I was sitting there having wanted to get rid of my gut and they said if you buy this gadget and you you clamp them six places and it has a little battery pack you reach right here and put and all day while you're working it's working your abs it's working your abs and then they showed this guy that looked like you could wash clothes on his abs. And I'm, how much is, how much is, I'm, I'm going, I think I'm going to try that. And, and before you know it, I'm thinking I could have abs like that and not even go to the gym, not even have to do any crunches. I can do, they, they'll get you. We want success, come on somebody, without any struggle. We want success without any toil. We want success with, uh, without any pain. But, uh, but if you're going to be successful, come on somebody, you know you got to put in the work. Uh, you, you might have to go through some things, and, but anything worth having is worth putting in the work for. Don't be fooled that, and that it can just be an overnight sensation. We, we do use the internet uh, for information to help us to see some of the things that people who are trying the same things that we are may have 
failed in. So we, we look and we can maybe see a better way, but you can never really just find out in the air an overnight sensation. Uh, you you, you got to still, you got to understand that there will be some degree of rigorous effort to see success. And they have fooled us. They want us. We, we have bought into this overnight wonder. Self-discipline is what we need. Self-discipline is essential. As I told you, that I believe the three things that, that we're in the earth for, I, I believe that self-discipline is going to help us to achieve those things. Paul is here writing to Timothy and to the people in the region of Ephesus, and he is here and he's at this point talking about exercising and the development by spiritual discipline. Now, he says, if you go back to the text, he says in verse number 7 in the latter clause, he says, on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And the Amplified says, keeping yourself spiritually fit. How spiritually fit are you? He says, you got to make sure you're keeping yourself spiritually fit. Verse number 8, he says, for physical training is of some value. He says, physical training is of some value. So those of you who are thinking I'm giving you a pass today for exercise, it's not going to happen. See, I knew I didn't have to go to the gym. The Bible says that, that spiritual discipline, no, no. He said physical training is of some value, all right? But notice then he goes on and he says, uh, but godliness, spiritual training is of value in everything, all right? Just read the text. He says, spiritual training is of value in everything and in every way. Why? He said, since it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. Your physical training, your physical discipline will only impact you in this world. Your spiritual discipline and training is going to impact you in this world and in the world to come. Do I have anybody in here? So you got to understand that, that physical discipline, you know, all those New Year's promises. How many of you, don't lift your hand. How many of you got new gym membership? You got them big old new sneakers? <laughs> Got you a new walking suit. You, in, you shop. Get, that's what I want. I'm telling all my children what I want for Christmas because I'm going in and I'm going to get in this gym this year. You got them tinny pups. They don't know what that, those are. You got this. I want, to, I want the running shoes, the ones I saw on TV. They look like they make you run fast. That's what I want. You got your compression shirts. You like me, you bought one that was really too small. Like, trying to do everything but go. You got physical discipline as a new year promise you got spiritual discipline as a new year promise all right now, now your goal in your physical discipline of course is for health and well-being we do need to exercise we do need to walk or run or go to the gym whatever it is that we need to do amen come on now i need some amens right there Cause I'm, 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 I'm telling, I'm putting my, my elders and ministers on, um, we getting on a regiment. 
They like holding their breath now, like, oh, God. But sometimes they get to praying and, and pray two or three minutes, and I hear them wheezing. I'm like, okay, I got to get my elders. I got to get, I got to get my, <laughs> one, I told my wife, I said, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to have to do it. I said that we were walking around, I remember we were walking around the inside of the gym. We were praying, and we were handing the mic to different ones praying. And I'm saying, now, my God, they're younger than I am. And some of them panting and praying, and they'd say a word and pant, pray another thing, pant. I'm like, we, okay. We, <laughs> we. So there's a goal. We, it's our health. It's our well-being and physical discipline. We want, you want to look good. You want to feel good. And that's good. You ought to. You ought to. We need to. Hallelujah the way we eat and so forth. We got to discipline ourselves and do better. And so you have your goal as a, in your spiritual discipline is to be a stronger Christian, all right? Now, I notice, though, that, that often there is more effort placed toward the physical discipline and less placed on the spiritual Huh? And, and, and you see, you see, because he says right here, he says that, that your physical training is of some value. All right? But we make it as if it's everything. And when I think about physical uh, uh, training, physical discipline, I start thinking about everything else that goes along with all that we are involved in. Not just exercising but but all of our other activities and pursuits and and career goals and objectives and all those things we tend to put more into the physical than we do in the spiritual but if we could ever get the revelation to understand that if I develop myself in the spiritual realm it's going to have great impact and influence on my physical realm I don't have anybody in here if I get myself spiritually fit it's going to cause me to be more successful on my physical side can I get a witness here you know we can get derailed in both of those we can become distracted Distractions. Come on, think about the things you were pursuing, things you were going after, and then you became distracted. You, you didn't finish. You, something else came across the screen, and you went after that. Uh, another pursuit, another idea. You know, you got distracted. How many have ever been distracted in things? Come on, ADD didn't just start uh, with this generation of young people. Some of us had it way back in the 60s. We had it, and, 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 and just, we have attention deficit disorder. And, and, and we got to recognize that distractions uh, make up a, a cause of why uh, we don't have good self-discipline. Being discontented, just not, not feeling good about things, and, and uh, uh, just, just seemingly restless can, can cause you to get off course. And, and, uh, and disappointments, we, we tend sometimes not to handle disappointments properly. Disappointments don't come to, to block you. They, uh, they, they're not here to stop you, but, um, but if you aren't careful, you will allow a disappointment to stop you, to break you down, to make you quit. And there are some people who were running well, and then you, you ran into a disappointment. Something didn't work in the way that you thought. It didn't happen. You didn't accomplish it as quickly as you hoped. And, and you became disappointed. And rather than persevering through or jumping over, you, you let it break you down and, and cause you to sit down. But, uh, but this is the year that uh, you are determining that I'm not allowing distraction. I'm not allowing discontentment. I'm not allowing di uh, disappointments uh, to cause me to break down. Uh, when we are tempted with all of those things, we are going forward in this year. Come on, somebody decree and that I'm working my uh, self-discipline in a new way and all the things they've been saying I shall have what I decree 
Well, let me tell you something. You got to speak it, but we said last week that your speaking is not speaking only uh, because faith without works is dead. That when you put it in the atmosphere, you decree a thing, and then you line up with God, and you move in the direction that God says do. There's no need in decreeing a thing, and then God says go, and, and there's a door open for you, but you're sitting there waiting, and you're sitting there waiting on God to drop it out of the sky. No, you got to move faith without works is dead do I have anybody in here and so he says he says that physical discipline is important but it only deals with the physical and the now but your spiritual discipline is more important because it deals with both now and the future your eternity and so our first priority as believers should be to be spiritually disciplined. Huh? It'll impact the way you approach life. It'll impact the way you approach business. It'll impact the way you deal with your relationships. All dealing with spiritual disciplines. There are spiritual disciplines in the church as a part of the kingdom. And, and if you are... Uh, in pursuit of being a manager, you got to have these disciplines in place to be effective for the kingdom. See, God is not setting us up for these great jobs and positions and opportunity for us to go there and act like the world. Come on. If we're really going to uh, uh, infiltrate culture... And we said that the only way we can change culture is to get out in the culture and begin to have influence there, then God is not opening up uh, to you all these opportunities and positions, and then you go in there and act like you don't have any kind of spiritual discipline. Sometimes you wonder, who are these people now? They prayed in church. They pray, saints know who, those who know the words of prayer, pray much for me. I'm, I got a job interview, I got a position, I got an opportunity, and everybody's praying in agreement. God opens up the door, and then you get in there, and you start acting like uh, everything but a Christian. You have opportunity to, to influence. I didn't say go in there preaching with a Bible, standing in your, in your supervisory position with a Bible open. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what he's saying. Uh, that's not what we're supposed to do. But because of who we have uh, inside of us, he will exude from us by the way we make decisions, by the way we deal with the employees and subordinates and all those other things. Uh, but some people get in there and forget all about their Christian training. They get big and big shouting and, and my God, don't look out for anybody else or help anybody else. And, and they're doing just as much dirt and dirtiness inside the positions that the people in the work come on somebody and so because you discipline yourself spiritually it's going to have an impact on how you deal with your relationships your spiritual discipline will impact your marriage how you deal with your uh, children how you deal with your in-laws come on somebody how you deal with your neighbors. It impacts all of those things. And, and so how you do business. Christians are not trying to, 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 to uh, voodoo somebody. You're in business. You're not, you're not tipping the scales. The Proverbs talk about those who, who put extra weight on the scale, uh, you know, to deceive and to make more. That's not what the Christians are doing. Politicians, you know, if you're running for an office and you get a position, uh, then uh, it, it's not time to go in there looking for kickbacks. We got we to gotta use our spiritual disciplines to help us to be successful in every aspect of life. Listen, write this down quickly and I'm done. One of the spiritual disciplines, of course, has to be prayer. You need a disciplined prayer life. Huh? Is that right? We need a disciplined prayer life. Jesus was the example of prayer. 
everything Jesus did, he went before the Father. Recognizing that I, I can do nothing without praying about it. I, I need to go before God because if I don't go before God, then, and then what directions am I following? Who am I following? What am I doing? Am I just moving by what the trends are? Am I just moving by what the culture is saying or doing? Or have I developed a prayer life where I know that all of my strength and my help and my direction and my inspiration comes because I'm in communication with God? What kind of prayer life do we have? You, you got to be self-disciplined in your prayer life. Uh, Mark 10 and verse number 45, uh, Jesus, Jesus talked about prayer. I'm going to get to that verse in a minute. But Jesus talked about uh, prayer and how important prayer is. Jesus prayed uh, in the wilderness 40 days. Every time Jesus got ready to do a, uh, a, a miracle, he would pray. Before he fed the 5,000, he prayed. He broke the bread and prayed. Now, after he had fed the 5,000, he sent his disciples onto the other side, and he says, I'm going into the mountain to pray. How, how are you praying? Or are you praying? Come on, seriously. Are you disciplined in prayer? Do we take time to pray? There are many ways and positions you can pray. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to get a stickler here and talk about if you're not laying prostrate, you're not praying. Because the Bible says man ought to always pray and not faint, pray without ceasing. So we can be praying as we're riding in the car. We have uh, difficult things on the job. We can steal away, go to the restroom and pray. You can, you can pray right there at your cubicle or your desk. And you can pray in the midnight. You know, grandmama said pray in the morning, pray at noon, and pray in the midnight hour. You just know that I've got to be a, I'm a human being who, who's spiritual, and I must be in touch with my creator. But we dismiss it until there's an emergency. And then we have big prayers. We, see, we believe in prayer, but we just don't discipline ourselves to, to pray until we need. We use God. I believe it works and it's needed, but I don't discipline myself to pray. So a part of our success has to come as a result of our prayer life. I depend on God. God, I don't want to do anything. I know what happens when I go on my own. Huh? You know, when the Israelites were, were getting ready to go and God, uh, they were leaving Egyptian captivity and they got to the place where they, they got big and, and uh, God said, listen, I'm going to leave you. I'm, I'm done, y'all. Hard-headed. And, and, and Moses uh, said, listen, we will not go without you. We got to become to that point that I don't want to do anything without God. We got to pray more with our families. We got to pray more with our spouses. We got to pray more with our children. We got to pray over our situation. When you go to work, when you're walking around in your job, you ought to be meditating and praying right there, doing what you're doing. God, help me to be uh, effective. Help, help me to make an impact. Help me to make a difference. Uh, yeah, we got to have a disciplined prayer life. If, if corporate meeting corporate prayer meeting is an indication of the church's prayer life did y'all get that if how we gather at the time of prayer is an indication of our personal prayer life we got trouble I don't believe that we're praying any more individually than we would corporately because we understand that corporate prayer is a part of being a, in the Christian community. If I'm not praying at home, I don't care anything about praying together with any other people. And I'm going to leave that alone. We got we to gotta, we gotta understand then that study, study, is we got to have a disciplined study life. All right? Turn over to 2 Timothy. Are y'all here? 
See, this is a part of your success. This is number two, having a disciplined study life. Second Timothy 2, and go down to verse number 15. I'm again, I'm still in this Amplified. Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved a workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. We need a disciplined study life. I'm telling you. And listen, we, we got to acknowledge, we got to acknowledge that we uh, function as though secular study is more valuable than studying God's word. We push our children to make sure they get their uh, grades, geometry, and language. All We make sure because we place more value in the secular system than we do in God's system. We will spend time. Let there be a need uh, for me. I've got a test or something I've got to do uh, for, toward my degree. And you ought to study. I'm not telling you not to. Or, or maybe there's a new something on the job that I've got to study for. Watch how much time. Watch how much time you spend making sure you pass that test, right? Huh? And we devalue studying God's word. Because we're not disciplined. We don't see the value in studying God's word. Or oh, I'll come, you know, to service and I'll come uh, long enough, maybe a couple of hours on Sunday. But when it's time for a class, when it's time for a Bible study, when it's time for a training, come on somebody, y'all not saying anything now. Because we don't have a disciplined study life. We don't know what the word says. And if we don't know what the word says and how to apply it to life, every time that devil, the rascal comes up and throws something that sounds truthful, we'll grab it. Come on. And that's why people are so wishy-washy and unstable. They're double-minded. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Because one minute I'm believing Jesus, the next minute I'm be believing uh, the next and newest, hottest thing. Because I will not study to become established. Number three. We need a disciplined worship slash serving life. Disciplined worship. Intentional worship. God established the system long ago that when the people approach me, they approach me in worship. Bow down and worship me. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Bring an offering when you come to worship me. Acknowledge who I am. Thou shalt have no other God before me. All throughout the Psalms, David talked about worship. And he not only talked about worship, but he talked about serving. Psalm 100 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. There ought to be some enthusiasm about your worship. There ought to be some excitement about that I'm going to acknowledge God. Worship is simply saying I find worth in who God is. And since I find worth and value in who God is, I'm going to acknowledge it by doing the things that God said to sing and dance and praise and, and, and all those things. And then serve me. Get into a position to serve. Come on. If you want to give back uh, to the community, then you ought to give back through the church. I don't have anything against any of these, you know, organizations but some of us give more service to those than you do to the church it was the church of Jesus Christ who saved you delivered you set you free established you and sustains you serving is being disciplined serving and and serving with honor not haphazardly huh you know, if, if you work your job like you serve in church and through the church, it won't be long. 
<laughs> Come on, somebody. See, 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 if you really are disciplined in your worship and service, you understand accountability that, listen, if I can't be in place where I'm supposed to be, then I'm going to let somebody know because I'm responsible and I'm accountable because I'm not just looking at this, oh, that's just the church. If you call in sick at the job, you ought to call in sick. If you were supposed to urge you, you just didn't show up. You spoke in the choir. You didn't tell the choir leader. You, you, you were supposed to serve in, in, in the ministry, in the pulpit. You didn't call and say anything because we don't find value in worship. We're not disciplined in worship and serving. I, I, need, I need that brother right there to come and train uh, my folk here because if I, if I could just have a hundred Elder Lawrence's who, who's going to be on point, who's going to give accountability, who's going to let you know ahead of time and he's going to say and yes sir, I'm like man I'm not, uh, I, I, I'll get a text and say sir, I'm such and such, sir I will not be able to be certain, I was like okay boy if I could just get everybody else to understand accountability and the value in being disciplined Oh, that's just the church. That's just Bishop. They'll, 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 they'll get somebody. I told you, I tried that on a job, and it, 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 it happened to me one time. And once was enough. But my God, I was in the 10th grade. And the fish were biting that Friday. And me and my boy said, man, these fish are biting. I'm supposed to be at Dietary at, at Charlotte Memorial Hospital at 4 o'clock. It was about 2.30. You know what I mean? Those fish were biting. And I said, man, I, I'm just not going today. And that was fine. I, I didn't go. I didn't call anybody and say a word. Kept, took a stringer full of fish. But that Saturday, Somewhere about quarter to four, I went in to clock in at my regular time. Hospital, you got a lot of name cards. They were back punching, but I don't know if they still do that. So I went to the, over where the M's were. <laughs> I don't see my name. I said, well, maybe they got it out of order. <laughs> over by the N's. And <laughs> I said, well, let me just start. <laughs> I looked. I got, so I went flying over to Mr. Hill and Mr. Patterson. Mr. Patterson was sitting there with his legs crossed. I said, Mr. Patterson, I, I don't see my time clock card. He said, that's because you don't work here anymore. It didn't take but one. It didn't take but one. It didn't take but one time. And I promise you. See, I had to go. I didn't even tell my parents. And if y'all get to heaven before I do, don't y'all say a word about what I said. They didn't know. I, I found a job before I got home. Because I knew 10th grade. Come on, come on. I learned accountability. I, I learned responsibility. You know, all right, one more and then we're done. You need a disciplined fasting life. A disciplined fasting life. A life of self-denial. Fasting allows you to focus on God's help, God's strength, God's revelation, and it helps develop you in Christian character. It helps to prepare you for what is ahead. Jesus fasted and prayed in the wilderness 40 days, and then the tempter came. But when the tempter came to tempt him on three occasions, he was able to stand. When you deny yourself of some of the things you desire and need and focus on God, you gain some spiritual strength even beyond that that you would have received from the physical because it's self-denial. And so if, there, if we're going to see success, self-discipline is a key. There must be a disciplined prayer life. There must be a disciplined study life. And there must be a disciplined worship slash serving life. And a disciplined fasting life. 
If you're going to be successful in fulfilling those three things in the earth, I'm here to learn to live, to live again. I'm here to help somebody else learn to live, to live again. And I'm here to fulfill whatever my assignment is. And whatever I'm doing and whatever I enjoy doing and whatever God has put me in a position to do, then I'm there to make a difference in the earth. I'm not going to worry about what it is you're doing. I'm not become, I won't become frustrated or jealous or envious because you're working in a certain place. You are where you are and I'm where I am because that's where God has gifted us to be. And if we do that to his glory, we're going to see success in our personal lives. We're going to see success in our families. Come on, somebody. We're going to see success in every aspect of our being, in our business, in our careers, in our pursuits. Somebody give God glory this morning and say, listen, I got to put some value in self-discipline. I miss too much. And I always go back and attribute it to self-discipline. Every time I look at something, either where I messed up, indulged, overdid, underdid, missed, stopped the pursuit, I look back and I see the path. You were running well. As Paul said, who hath bewitched you? What is it that got you off the hunt? What is it that calls you to swerve and every time it's self-discipline don't just say when the enemy came and threw me off track if you operated and functioned in these four areas of self-discipline you would know how to deal with that devil well, I got so frustrated it just seemed like everybody else was successful it seemed like everybody else was winning it seems like that everybody that what they were doing was causing them to have victory and I just quit it's lack of self discipline sometimes it's instant gratification it doesn't seem like you know how the movie the kids are we there yet some believers in their pursuit in the things of God, are we, are we there yet? Are we there yet? The race is not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. The Bible says, God is not mocked. Whatsoever things a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He also says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap what if you faint not sometimes we get to the you shall reap and we forget the if you faint not somebody's tired this morning somebody's weary this morning somebody's frustrated this morning because it seems like you put in all your effort and it seems like the more you try the further back you go you have looked over in somebody else's lane and you see that it looks like they're doing well their family their career their job their children their spiritual life we're always looking at everybody else's and God's God's saying that if you will just exercise self-discipline I've got opportunities positions new walks new realms new experiences with your name on it but are you willing to pursue it with a determination are you willing to to find value in spiritual discipline I know you got value in physical discipline, physical training. I know you believe that. You believe that you, the harder you work on your job, the, the better you're going to be. 
no matter what morals or values you're exercising, I'm just working hard and forget about my spirituality. But if you team up and carry your spirituality into that position, they will promote you and they don't even understand why. They, you, they, they, there'll be people on the job, you're working that job and you're smiling over there with your headphones on and you playing, you know, your CD and your gospel and you rocking like that over there and you doing that, pulling those things and, and everybody else standing around looking at them telling, I don't know why, why she's so happy. What is he so excited about? They cut our hours back for two and a half hours this week. What's wrong with her? And you still just running. You working. Huh? They don't understand. And before you know it, they'll be elevating you and they don't even understand why. They'll be giving you promotion and they're not even giving out raises right now. But they'll elevate you because you're exercising your spirituality. If you teach your children Bible study and Bible verses and teach them to pray and teach them to be academic, you're going to find a well-balanced child. But when you teach them that the game is more important than Bible study, the game is more important, and, and, and cheering and dancing and karate and quad, tom, quad, 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 what is it? Taekwondo. Is more important than, than youth activities. You telling them to put everything before God. You teaching them. Self-discipline. Everybody stand. Self-discipline, a key to success. Where are you today in your prayer life? in your study life, in your worship, and your service. Where are you when it comes to fasting? You don't have to wait for the church to call a fast. You can decide I'm fasting and nobody else has to know it. It's just a part of my discipline. It's a part of me perfecting the things concerning God. If you're looking for dynamic worship, inspirational teaching, and a friendly atmosphere, you can visit us on Sundays at 221 West Bradley Street in Gastonia, North Carolina. For more information about our ministry, you can call 704-865-9016. To order your personal copy of today's message or any other broadcast, please call 704-865-9016 and indicate the broadcast date. Or you can just visit us online at www.friendshipgastonia.com. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast with Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church. Make sure you join us next week at the same time. And remember, let God take control and let the Spirit flow.